Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Nick Lemon, and uh, I am here in my capacity as director of Columbia Global Reports, which you'll hear uh, more about for those who aren't familiar with us in a minute. Um, and this is our official fifth birthday party. Um, you know, there's a lot of bad things about the pandemic that we're in. And one of the bad things is that you can't have real parties. So we began uh, this year planning to have an actual nice party and we had rented a space and you know, we were gonna have a caterer and hors d'oeuvres and things like that. We might've even had music. So I, I'm here to uh, apologize uh, for, for it's not being that kind of event. And maybe sometime in the future, life will be back to normal and we'll have that kind of event. There is at least some silver lining in the situation we're in now, which is um, if you're in the audience, it's easier to attend an event uh, than it is in normal times. It's, it's not as big a logistical commitment. And if you're presenting, um, you uh, have the ability to get pretty much anybody to come and be a guest. So we have uh, our president, Lee Bollinger, who will come on in a second, and, and four of our authors. Um, and whether we would have been able to put that lineup together for a normal party, I don't know. Um, so I, I want to start with Lee, who uh, is in, in many ways our founder, um, just to kind of talk with him about how this enterprise got started. Um, by way of a little bit of background, we're um, a book publisher. We publish uh, books in a uniform format, um, fairly short, uh, beautiful looking, high quality paperbacks. We've published 26 so far with many more in the pipeline um, that are supposed to take on large issues. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, we published our first season of books in the fall of 2015. Um, if you wanna get technical, we started working in the summer of 2014, uh, but we'll date our birthday from when we first started publishing. Lee, um, you have a better memory than me. So I assume you remember this too, but maybe you don't. The way this all started was, it was um, I think the fall of 2012, and, uh, you know, deans at Columbia, I was dean of the journalism school at that time, and dean served in renewable five-year terms. So I'd served one term, I'd served a second term, and then I had told Lee I didn't want to serve a third term. Um, so we were at a meeting of the Pulitzer Prize Board, which we were both on at the time, and Lee sort of took me aside during a coffee break and said, well, if you're not going to keep being dean, and I've got another idea for you. Do you remember that, Lee? I do. So can you sort of recreate uh, what caused you to have that conversation? Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to get too elaborate about this, but I there were three big forces that in my mind sort of came to, uh, came to a conclusion here. One was uh, the phenomena of globalization and the incredible uh, forces that were making the world smaller and smaller, more and more integrated. There was secondly, the decline of the press in covering globalization because of the financial constraints and uh, that the internet primarily uh, brought to bear on media. And I was watching that on a variety of uh, perspectives, but on the board of the Washington Post Company and the closing of foreign bureaus and so on. So you had the, the unbelievable uh, changes in the world happening and the uh, decline of the ability uh, of the press to cover it. And you also had universities that uh, had set up a way of understanding the world after World War II, a sort of uh, framework for knowledge that was, uh, I felt outdated in the new world. So, so there was a, very, very great need for some kind of um, coverage of what was happening, interpretation of what was happening uh, that was between scholarship, but could also change scholarship and could fill the void. 
uh, that was happening uh, in the media. And you uh, were, <laughs> were one of the great, great uh, journalists, writers, uh, editors uh, in the country. And uh, you uh, were uh, available or might be available. And it seemed to me that you could put this together uh, and make something that was quite significant. And you have done that, Nick, in five years. Uh, it's astonishing what's been accomplished. And, and so uh, on behalf of all the authors, on behalf of all the readers, on behalf of the university, on behalf of me, uh, I want to begin by congratulating and thanking you. So that's was presented to you as an opportunity to do something together and you seized it and, um, and uh, this is the result. Let me thank you, uh, that's very generous. And let me ask you a little more about uh, a couple of the themes you raised. First of all, there's, uh, maybe I'm missing something. I'm not seeing a lot of major universities getting into the business of being originators of journalism. Um, what is it about that that to you feels like an appropriate thing for a research university to be doing and, and a public service? Yep. So, um, so as you know, I grew up in, the, in a journalist family. My father ran a small town newspaper. And I've always felt that there is a real kinship between what journalists do and what scholars do. It just the time frame is different, you know, the degree to which you reflect on things, the search for deeper and deeper meanings. I mean, there are differences between what a journalist does and what a scholar does, but there is a, a fundamental uh, similarity in a, a kind of trying to understand, trying to know, trying to interpret and to serve the public interest. So that's part of the culture of uh, journalism and it's certainly part of the culture of uh, scholarship. So to me, there's never been any kind of uh, differentiation between high quality journalism and high quality scholarship. It was very natural to me to think about having a journalism school to having uh, uh, many um, journalistic kinds of activities in the institution. And of course, Columbia is already uh, there. So I felt that, um, that this was a natural uh, kind of mission that the university could undertake, um, completely consistent with its, um, with its fundamental role of discovering knowledge and providing the public with information. Let me ask you a, a version of the question in a broader frame. And if you could talk a little about what you've been calling the fourth purpose of the university. What, what I know and not everyone watching will know is that this is only one of a number of initiatives that you've started that are non-traditional activities for major universities yeah. that entail bringing the university outside its walls into the world in a more engaged way. So could you talk about that a little? So, um, so let's say there, there were really two things that I felt uh, were going, needed to go on in to reform universities as it were. One was what I mentioned before and what you have, um, have acted on which is uh, the framework of knowledge in the broadest possible sense of that framework that was developed in the decades after the Second World War was no longer adequate to, to really comprehend what was happening in the modern world. There really is no longer a separation between sort of domestic things and international, but many of our intellectual structures uh, take that as a given that there is a, a difference. So you need to break that down and the other was a feeling that universities had become too insular, too isolated from the world. And, and both the scholarship suffers when that happens uh, in many disciplines, not all, but in many disciplines. And universities uh, have a responsibility to play a greater degree of involvement in the, um, 
affairs of the world and try to solve problems. So that's the globalization theme and how universities should adjust to it. And the uh, fourth purpose theme and how universities should be greater participants in the world. The Columbia Global Reports that, that you've established, Nick, we know has this kind of uh, bridge between trying to understand the world more in ways that the press and scholarship do not uh, really cover as much and to provide a foundation then for changing the intellectual framework the scholarship and also uh, a foundation for doing things in the world and projects and the like. Um, when we first started working together, Lee, which was now many years ago in the 2002 to 2003 school year, it was because uh, you had convened a task force to think about the future of journalism and the future of the journalism school in particular. I served on that task force as a working journalist and then that turned into my being Dean of the Journalism School. Um, as I look back on that task force, it feels sort of quaint. As I recall our, our deliberations, the theme was there are these great news organizations that, that will that dominate the scene and will always dominate the scene. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is they're just not quite as good as they should be. And our job is to use, you know, Columbia, Columbia Journalism School, universities generally to, you know, make their work even better than it is. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, you may have had these thoughts too, we didn't understand how quickly the world was going to blow up, the world of journalism, but it certainly did. I'm curious, you know, what do you think is the state of journalism today? It's a big question, but what's our field doing right? What's it doing wrong? What, what challenges should we be thinking about meeting? So I completely agree that when we uh, begin thinking about journalism universities together, that is you and I, and, and we started together in that uh, task force on journalism schools and our journalism school in particular. Like so many people, we just could not imagine a world that surfaced very quickly after that within the decade, of course, uh, in which news sources would, would proliferate and information sources would um, expand exponentially and great journalism institutions would feel under financial siege. We just didn't fully see that. And, and there's been sort of the evolution. I mean, we're still looking for a kind of equilibrium uh, in this new world. I think what I see is um, a transition of journalism institutions to um, the, the sort of um, benign uh, ownership and oversight of very, very wealthy people. So wealth is the answer to serving the public good. Um, whether that will continue or not, whether that's a sustainable uh, model, but not only financially, but uh, uh, editorially, journalistically, I, I don't know. Um, we both know that the state and local journalism has been, has been devastated by this. The, um, the national, I think, is very strong, uh, maybe stronger than it was a decade ago in many respects. The international global coverage seems to me still uh, relatively thin compared to what it ought to be. I mean, just um, I think our knowledge of China to take one major kind of issue that we in the world face is, is really surprisingly, almost shockingly um, uh, uh, superficial. I mean, I think we, we just don't have as rich an understanding of that society and culture as we ought to have. Um, and that's true also of scholarship, I think, um, and goes back to the point about the underlying framework for scholarship in universities. So I, um, you know, if I had my uh, full way, I would take Columbia Global Reports and 
it would be expanded into a major news organization that um, that would provide the kind of information and knowledge we need. Um, let me say first an immediate response to what you said on yesterday, our, the manuscript for our fourth book about China landed. Yeah. So we're, we're doing our part. Yes, um, exactly. Uh, you'll see a little later in the program. You know, just to conclude your part of the program on the point you just raised, um, when we had the fabled conversation in the fall of 2012, uh, Lee didn't say start a book publishing company. He did say start an, a, a, a news organization of global ambition. Mm -hmm. So if uh, somebody came along who was infinitely resourced, uh, we could think about doing other things than what we do. But I do think you know what we ended up with was a kind of sweet spot, we think, um, we have elements of magazine journalism and elements of book publishing. We have elements of, you know, journalism itself and elements of academic life. Um, there's a whole landscape. And we'll talk about this a little later. Besides what you talked about of new nonprofit news organizations, that's another yeah. part of the, the changes in journalism. And we think of ourselves as part of that landscape. Um, you know, what that means is that as a nonprofit news organization, I always say to my friends who go into this field, uh, you think because you're going into a nonprofit, you're going to have to think about business less, but you're actually going to have to think about it more. And that's not something uh, that will be mysterious to you, Ray. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, so we fundraise and we depend on that. We've had yeah. generous uh, support from funders and from the university. Um, we're a little unusual in this new landscape uh, because we sell our editorial content through book sales. We arrived at book sales because we thought we could find a niche where, you know, in the magazine world, super long articles have kind of gone, gone away. And there, there wasn't anything between a standard magazine article and a book that can take three to five years to get out into the public. So we thought that was a, a good place for us to be. Um, also, um, once you say something is a book, you, you can, it becomes an event. And, and uh, there's a whole machinery. It's not as big as it used to be, but it still exists for promoting something that's called a book that doesn't exist for something that's called a white paper or an article right. or something like that. It's an object you can hold in your hand and it becomes the basis for a larger conversation. And we've had a lot of uh, luck with that. Um, and you will hear more about that as, as, as we talk to our authors. Um, but that the, the book begins a, as a way of putting a, a big subject that isn't getting enough attention on the agenda. And we've been lucky that when we do that, quite often it stays on the agenda. So, so uh, we've been happy with the way we found to do this uh, with the, the resources we have. And you know, if we had a lot more resources, we'd think about other things to do. Um, last question for you is, um, do you think universities and journalism sort of getting married is in the future going to be a Columbia thing or a systemic thing? You know, I, I think it will be a Columbia thing. And I think it, it has, uh, th there is no reason in my, in, from my perspective, why a great university should not also be providing the kind of information to the public that great journalism does. Uh, it's an, it, we do great scholarship. That's, um, as I said at the beginning, a kind of variation on trying to, one form of trying to understand the world, but journalism is another form and very much uh, motivated by the same goals. So I see, again, back to the beginning, no inconsistency, and I would love to see more. And what you have provided here, Nick, with this publishing um, operation is, is, as you say, and as I would say, 
really a base for a lot more that could happen. Um, and it's just a matter of resources, really. So I see this happening. Uh, what I would have to say, but you could also answer this, I don't see other universities moving to fill this kind of um, uh, space uh, in the way that we have. So I think it's still unique. And uh, I, I take some pride in that, but I also uh, somewhat sad about it. Yeah, well, I feel a little bittersweet too, because um, as far as I can tell, in the entirety of the history of higher education in the United States, you're the university president who is most interested ever in journalism and has it as a sort of primary interest. I don't think there's a lot of other examples. Yeah. Uh, there's Robert Maynard Hutchins, yeah. who had a keen interest in journalism, which was just to endlessly talk about how horrible it was. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I think you could have been that. more productive. So right. I, I want to say, uh, on my own behalf, everybody who works at Columbia Global Reports and our authors, thank you. Um, it, it's really unusual to have the ability to work for the university president who's more interested in journalism than any other university president has ever been if you're a journalist. So um, don't think it's gone unnoticed or unappreciated. Thanks very much, Nick. But thank you for taking this on and making it such a brilliant, brilliant um, fact from a, from a wonderful idea that it's been a pleasure to share with you. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. And so now I'm going to go to act two of this event which is to talk to uh, four of our authors, um, all among the more recent authors. Per uh, what Lee was saying at the beginning, um, we didn't plan it this way exactly. Exactly 50% of the authors will be talking to our journalists and 50% are academics. Um, in, in real life, it's probably more like three quarters journalists that we publish and, and one quarter academics. But I wanna bring them on one by one and then they'll stay on your screen and we'll, we'll sort of have an introductory conversation then go to a more general conversation. I'm gonna do this in the order in which we publish the, their books chronologically. So first, uh, I wanna welcome Tim Wu, who is a law professor here at Columbia and, and uh, his book is called The Curse of Bigness. So Tim, if you could just start by saying first how this book came to you and second, why did you come to Columbia Global Reports with it? Uh, Nick, thanks for uh, thanks for having me here, and it's a uh, it's a pleasure. I'd like to think I, I slightly straddle the line between uh, academia and, and journalism, um, but uh, let me uh, to answer your question. Um, I had uh, long wanted to uh, try to write a, a, a sort of one volume work that would represent. Uh, sort of revivalist uh, uh, volume, a, a monograph almost for, for those who wanted to know about antitrust and understand uh, why uh, it was an important American tradition and need to make a comeback. So I started drafting this thing. Um, I was also obsessed with the work of Louis Brandeis. And uh, I didn't <coughs> really know what to do with it um, uh, because it was in this uneven format. It was um, you know, starting on it, I realized would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 or 40,000 words or something like, I didn't want it to be this 80,000 word, um, you know, volume. I wanted it to be something, uh, a page turner about antitrust. <laughs> and, um, uh, I, I had the idea, I said, well, maybe I'll just put it out as a PDF. That was sort of my uh, idea. And I was talking to, uh, Frank Four, who some of you might know, uh, uh formerly of New Republic, currently of the Atlantic. And he said, "Hey, why don't you go talk to Nick?" So that was uh, that's that's basically how how it went down. And uh, you know, I uh, it, as I remember saying at the book party, I'm I'm glad I just I didn't go the PDF route. I'll just put it that way. And um, uh, I was very grateful for the editing, for the format, for everything. I mean, there's a reason for books um, uh, that isn't exactly filled by by PDFs that you release online. And um, yeah, so I was a, a tremendously pleased uh, to, to, to publish it. Um, early in the process, after we had signed up the book, uh, Tim invited uh, Jimmy So, our editor, and, and me to come to a 
sort of presentation of the ideas that he did to his law school colleagues. This is something um, that anybody who's familiar with law schools knows about us outsiders don't so much. Uh, I was sort of shocked, uh, as I told you, because I felt like you were presenting these ideas and they were all saying, you're crazy, you've lost your mind. Antitrust is, a, is a, an antiquated idea that has no uh, utility in the modern world. Was I reading the room wrong or was that the conventional wisdom before you wrote this? You know, I'd almost uh, forgotten that event and the way you forget a, a trauma um, <laughs> from a previous time. Yeah, that was basically it. Uh, I would say that event was uh, fairly, uh, I, let's say the proposal was not well received, but um, it kind of, um, I, I, I like to think, you know, fortunately, I'm fairly established. I have tenure, so uh, you know, I don't have to, um, uh, uh, you know, have to prove anything of those events. And it was uh, an important event to understand the degree of uh, resistance, uh, kind of a born of a uh, even on the left. Uh, you know, because law professors are roughly speaking kind of center left, more center than left. Um, to a, a revivalist idea, to the ideas of Louis Brandeis. So it kind of gave me my target. So, yeah, but it was uh, in terms of um, uh, in a successful event. No, it was it was uh, uh, an hour of being shellacked by skeptical, uh, very smart colleagues. Well, it feels like a million years ago because it feels like now everybody agrees with you. Am I am I misreading that? Uh, and, and can you talk a little bit about just how the book was received and how the mood of the country seems to be changing on, on this issue. Well, well, thanks. Yeah, I, I do think the ground has shifted. Um, I think books like this, um, I don't want to overstate my case, but my, my target is uh, that which is taken for granted. And uh, I think it was taken for granted uh, even three or four years ago that antitrust was uh, uh, of another time, uh, sort of a uh, nostalgic tradition, um, useful for, for a couple of purposes, but not important for, for broader questions of power. I do think that has changed. And um, I've, I've enjoyed uh, watching it change. The book itself, I think, I had in, in my mind, I had the target audience um, of, for the kind of comprehension thinking of a DC uh, congressional staffer. That was kind of who I was thinking about. Um, I wasn't targeting this book at antitrust experts. I wasn't really targeting at the general public. Or I wanted them to be able to read it. Uh, I wanted uh, to reach people who sort of, you know, the word antitrust law meant something to them and, and they felt something might be going on and they wanted to, to learn more. It was very gratifying when it became a Washington Post bestseller. It sort of showed that we'd, we'd hit our, we'd hit our target, target market. And um, I, in fact, I remember doing book events in, in DC. They were absolutely, uh, DC was definitely the, the place for this book. Uh, I probably sold more in DC than, than in, in, in New York, which is very rare for a book. Um, and I went to, um, I forgot the name of that bookstore in Maryland that everyone goes to, but it was, uh, I think, the, what's that? Politics and prose. Politics and prose, that's right. And uh, it was, uh, believe it or not, a standing room only event. And that made me think uh, at first that I was very glad to do a book, because as you said, Nick, it's kind of an established sort of channel for, for books. It's like, here's the idea. Um, and, uh, and also I, I felt that it hit its audience. And, you know, there are a lot of people who've, this is a risk of blowing my own horn, but uh, what's this event about? I mean, uh, you know, Amy Klobuchar, for example, called me and wanted to meet with me about the book. Um, there's a lot of senators uh, who read or at least had their staff or read the book. Uh, and so there, you know, there, there, this was, um, you know, it, it didn't sell a million copies, but uh, I'd rather sell, you know, uh, 90 copies to, to senators, Senate staff than, than 100,000 um, or just uh, sort of randomly. Uh, so, yeah, it was I, I think um, it, it was, you know, it doesn't always happen. Usually books in one way or another don't quite do what you want. But um, uh, this uh, maybe the timing was right. Uh, maybe it was the, the, the cover art, which was terrific. Maybe it was the the, smart, the size. Uh, one thing, Nick, I'll, I'll give you some credit. You you were very, um, uh, without being insulting, you said it did start to drag through the 1930s. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, the New Deal can can catch up many a narrative. It's so complicated. So I was like, ah, oh, forget it. I just deleted the whole center section. And I think it made the book a book that people got to the end of. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, you never really know. I'm going to bring on the second of our four authors now, Jeffrey Wasserstrom, a.k.a. Jeff. Um, so, Jeff, can you turn on your video? Uh, he is a professor at UC Irvine. Um, I'm not seeing you yet, so can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Hi. Okay. And Tim, you can just stay <coughs> on if, um, if you don't mind people seeing you. Um, so uh, Jeff's book is called Vigil. It was published at the very beginning of 2020. Um, and like Tim's book, it was really good lucky timing for us because it was, uh, you know, right before things got really bad in Hong Kong, at least as I remember it. Um, and I think since things got really bad, we're still the only book length explanation of, of that situation um, that's out there. Um, so, so we've been, you know, thrilled with how that's gone. Same question I, I posed to Tim initially. Can you just recount how you and Columbia Global Reports got connected? Yeah, it's actually really, um, it fits in very well with your conversation with President Bollinger because you and I met when you came out to Irvine, which has an undergraduate program in literary journalism, which is very unusual. And there's a forum for the academy and the public that's devoted to conversations that link uh, academics and journalists that Amy Willens here um, uh, founded and, and was the founding director of. So you were out for a conference for that and we started talking about the book series. And I had also come across Basharat Pear's um, book, which I think is really extraordinary, uh, that combines discussion of India um, under Modi and Turkey under Erdogan. And um, this sort of moves toward strongman rule in those two places. One. It was pre-Donald Trump too. Right, and it was, a, it was one, one strong man that was anti-Muslim and another that was linked to Muslim. Anyway, it was, a, it was a great book. And I actually first got interested in the series because of that book and working with the Los Angeles Review of Books, um, another nonprofit uh, undertaking to try to do new things in journalism and help get it reviewed there. Ironically, by somebody who ended up being a Columbia Global Reports uh, writer too, David Kay wrote the review for it. Um, so I got fascinated by Hong Kong um, when protests began to happen there, especially in 2014, the umbrella movement. My first book had been on student movements in Shanghai in the past. And it had, I'd finished work on my dissertation around the time of Tiananmen, but I hadn't made it over to Tiananmen because my wife and I had first, just had our first child. And also I thought that if I got on a plane, by the time I got there, the movement might be over because movements are very unpredictable. You don't know how big they'll grow or how long they'll wait. So I was determined to go see the umbrella movement while it was underway and I went there and I started writing reportage about Hong Kong as I went back there. And I'd always been interested in the sort of borderline between academic and journalistic writing. I'd collaborated with um, journalists. I'd done events with journalists, including Howard French at, um, Columbia School of Journalism. Um, so anyway, actually, when I talked to you about the Hong Kong, I talked to you about the fact there should be a Hong Kong book in this series when we met up to talk about the series. And I thought of some journalists. I didn't think, I thought this was a, this was a series for journalists. And so I mentioned some journalists you might wanna to talk to. And luckily for me, you and um, Jimmy So, who was a wonderful editor to work with and has deep roots in Hong Kong, said, hey, we, we saw this piece you did for the Atlantic online and it was kind of an elegy for what seemed to be the impending demise, not of Hong Kong, but of democratic hopes in Hong Kong or the threats to democratic hopes in, hopes in Hong Kong. Could I imagine expanding that into a book myself? And I, I love the idea. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you see happening you know, now and in the months to come in Hong Kong? Is, is it basically all over for Hong Kong as a separate entity from China? 
So I think as a separate entity, I think it's, it's really become, uh, I just gave a talk earlier today in Toronto and I called it the fall of Hong Kong. And I resist the idea of death of Hong Kong because the city is still vibrant and there's still resistance there. The same way there was resistance in Czechoslovakia after the end of Prague Spring, in Poland after the end of Solidarity in uh, 1981. But I think the fall, we think of fall under the control. And I think in a way the institutions that had some degree of separateness have largely fallen under the control of Beijing. And right now I'm, I'm really concerned about the degree to which universities there are beginning to fall under, under control as well. Could you talk a little about the reaction that the book has gotten? So the reaction to the book, I, I, I guess I'd push back a little bit about the luckiness of the timing. I mean, it, it, it was incredibly timely when it came out, but it was also a difficult time for a, a book on anything to be published. And I mean, I was very fortunate. I got, and I got wonderful support from the press, not only a, a wonderful cover um, and great editing, but also help with setting up uh, a book tour in the US. And, but then the pandemic, came and the plans to promote the book in England, where I thought there would be a particular interest in um, Hong Kong due to the, the country's past. Uh, those all had to be canceled for it. And it was hard to get attention for a book at that point. Um, but I've been very pleased with um, the attention that's gotten and that there's been um, some pickup for, for making up for lost time when fortunately for the book, but unfortunately for Hong Kong, a new series of events that have played into what in some ways, I, res I said that Hong Kong makes a fool of forecasters. I won't make forecasts. You and Jimmy pushed me to be a little bit forecasting and you pushed me to say things that I hate to say have been happening. So I end up looking um, as if I could see things coming in ways that I probably wouldn't have gone on record with if you hadn't pushed me. So thank you for that, even if I didn't thank you for it at the time. And, and I also, you know, credit where due, I want to thank the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, which funded this particular book um, under a, a, you know, unspecific grant to publish a couple of books on the state of democracy around the world. Um, next, I'll call on Margaret Sullivan, who's next in the chronological order. Um, her book uh, came out over the summer. Um, and uh, so, Margaret, I hope you're, yeah, there you are. Welcome. Thank you. Um, same question I've asked the others, if, if you could first talk about how you came to write a Columbia Global Reports book, which is your first book, um, and, and then a little about the book itself. Thank you, Nick, uh, and, and thanks for having me here and, and doing this. Um, well, it, how I came to write this book is that you came to me and um, suggested that I might be an author for the press and um, suggested a lunch with your small but powerhouse team at Columbia Global Reports. And I mean that it's a great group of people, Camille McDuffie and Jimmy and, and yourself and, and some others. Um, and I had a couple of ideas uh, and this idea about the decline of local journalism, particularly local newspapers was very much in my wheelhouse because I have been the, had been the top editor of a regional newspaper in my hometown, which is Buffalo. I started there as a summer intern and became the editor of the paper before I went to the New York Times as public editor. Um, so I had a couple of ideas and you came back to me and said, you know, you thought that this would be the one. And I was very pleased to uh, be asked to do this and to get the encouragement to do it because um, as a newspaper columnist, which is what I do now for the Washington Post, I tend to think in 800 word increments and it's, it's not easy to sort of fit in or think in a different way, um, a bigger, broader way, though I had wanted to write a book and actually had made some starts on things that, you know, didn't quite take off. So it was uh, really, it's been such a privilege 
to do it. And it really came about because of your um, initiative. I've been amazed uh, in, in the case of this book. This is, you know, Lee Bollinger talked about it. You talked about it. I, as, as when I was dean at the journalism school, saw this happening. And I found it frustrating to try to get attention to this issue. Um, and, and it wasn't for lack of trying when I was at the journalism school. And I know you've written about it a lot. I was uh, impressed that this book, Ghosting the News, was able, as far as I could tell, to really take the conversation to a new place and get people finally focused on this issue. And that's partly your skill in writing it and your passion. And partly, you know, as I said before, if, you, if you're publishing a book, it's easier to make that kind of thing happen. I don't know if that was your experience. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I was, abs I was really surprised and blown away by the amount of attention that this subject got. I mean, I could have written uh, the same number of words in columns or magazine pieces and nothing would have happened. But as you say so well, when you publish a book, there's a sort of event around it and it is something that you can hold in your hand. And, and um, it got a lot of attention. I mean, for example, one example of, of, of several, the New York Times did not only a review, but a question and answer piece on this subject with me, uh, The Atlantic did a review and actually asked me to write a sort of associated piece about how local journalism serves the democracy and you know, tying it back to the founders. Um, and that happened a lot. So it, it, got, a, it got a tremendous amount of attention. Uh, you know, as, as Jeff says, the events that would have been promotional events in person turned into uh, turned into Zoom events, but there were a lot of them, and they went well. and And I felt like it did um, it did hit its target audience. I was concerned that this huge thing was happening in journalism, and people I knew from the research around it that people really weren't aware that local journalism and local newspaper was as threatened as it is and you know really imperiled so i think the book went some distance toward making a, a change in that let me bring on uh, our fourth and most recent author uh krithika varagor so if you could turn on your video um her book is called the call and it's um a very ambitious and, and thoroughly reported look at uh, the Saudi Arabia's long running project of uh, proselytizing for a certain form of Islam all over the world. So I'm gonna start with the same question to you, Krithika. This is also Krithika's first book, by the way. Um, and you know, without insulting any of our other authors, I think she's the youngest of us on the screen now. Um, age about what 26 or something like that um so how did the how did you get connected to us and how did the, where did this book come from um it was uh i'm not making this up for anyone but it was like a rom-com um i was working as a foreign correspondent in indonesia and i was home um, for my summer vacation and i was in new york city um, and I had been kind of working on this proposal for a book about, um, you know, the Saudi campaign to propagate Wahhabi Islam, and I'd been working on this proposal, and it was kind of going in a direction, I was being pressured to go in a direction I didn't really want to, to make it into this kind of like doorstopper and make myself a character in the story for some reason and kind of turn it into like narrative journalism, which is not really what I wanted to do at the time. I was reporting on religious fundamentalism, and I you know, the reason I wanted to write this book was I felt like there was a lot of kind of basic facts about this phenomenon that just weren't in the public record. So I was kind of like, maybe maybe there's no place for a book like this. Um, that's fine, I'll just keep doing journalism. I'm having a pretty fun life in Indonesia anyway. Then I was browsing at the Strand um, in August of 20, 
18 and I, um, or it must have been June actually, and I saw this book in the World Affairs section called High Speed Empire, which is a CGR title, and it was about um, the effect of the Belt and Road campaign in Southeast Asia. And I flipped through, I read half of it in the store, bought it, finished it, and the next day I emailed I looked up who runs this imprint. It was that someone named Jimmy So, and I just emailed him cold and I told him about my book idea. And uh, he got it immediately. And the ball rolled pretty quickly from there. He's like, send me a prospectus. I kind of had one already. Um, and then uh, he's like, okay, we like this. He got the vision immediately. My idea was to report on what the Saudi soft power campaign had done in three different countries um, around the Muslim world. And in places we wouldn't, typically cover as the Muslim world. So, you know, in Africa, Southeast Asia and the Balkans and not just in the Middle East. And immediately because of CGR's, you know, scope, he immediately got the vision and then he brought you in. We Skyped, I was in Bosnia by then. Um, and uh, I think we, you know, we were all on the same page. And by that fall I had book contract and I was set on this, uh, this journey. So, and then it became the craziest year ever because um, the proposal was simple, but not easy. So it did kind of end up being reported the way I suggested it, but that meant I had to go to Nigeria twice and Indonesia once and Kosovo and Bosnia three times and Saudi Arabia once within the span of a year as I was writing this book. Um, but it was a really fun adventure and- uh, You wouldn't be able to do it in 2020, that's for sure. Absolutely not. I mean, I was the, I would think it was the first of your books. Jeff was a little bit on the cusp to come out truly during the pandemic. So I was like 100% lockdown mode. And I felt really lucky when I came home from my virtual book tour that I managed to report this book under the wire. Yeah, um, really. I want to say also that uh, unlike any book publisher I know of, we pay for reporting expenses. Um, this book ha also had foundation support from the Mellon Foundation and that helped, but even books that aren't supported by foundations, if the author's willing and able, uh, will send you all over the world, including the many trips you just mentioned. Yeah, and that was that's one of the best parts of working with CGR. I definitely recommend it to a lot of my friends. It's really amazing to have that kind of support to travel and report these stories because, I mean, I don't know why it's not more standard, but it's. I feel really lucky to have worked with you guys for this book. It wouldn't have happened any other way. I wouldn't have been able to run these trips otherwise. Where do you see the subject of your book going? That is the... the, the spreading Wahhabi Islam all over the world. Is that going to continue or, or is that of interest to the new leadership of the kingdom? Um, you know, Saudi Arabia is definitely in the spotlight and for different things now. They're, they have a kind of ultra-nationalist vision under MBS. But I think the legacy effects of the campaign, which is what my book was about, are still really important to you know, foreign policy, foreign affairs, national security, uh, because the kind of long tail of these developments, especially in places like the Sahel and places where there are militancies, so it's not really just ISIS, but there are still militancies around the world. It's very poorly understood. And it's very poorly communicated in the media to this day. There's a lot of confusion in terms. So I think that and, and, and you know, when I when I went to report my book, I realized that the kind of working definitions we had, especially in the American security establishment, um, about kind of Islamist movements, especially outside the Middle East, were really antiquated. So they were like frozen in time around 9/11 when the spotlight turned on these things. But it's been almost 20 years since 9/11, and the record hasn't been updated at all. So I think um, I think the Salafi movements and things that I wrote about are going to be really important going forward and not just for terrorism but also understanding the politics of countries like Indonesia and Nigeria where these are all you know, these people are all influencing national politics to this day. Um, we have about 10 minutes left um, and I'd like to try to have a little more general conversation with our authors. Um, you know when I was speaking with Lee I and I don't want to be too directive here but I'll be a little directive so um, we were talking about the panel on journalism and journalism schools that he convened 
in the 02, 03 year when we thought, um, you know, there were these great news organizations that would live forever. Uh, and boy, were we wrong. In general, you know, we're one fifth of the way into the 21st century. And it just feels very different to me from the new millennium when it dawned. And, and at least in the world I was in, um, and I'm, I'm saying this as sort of self-flagellation, there was this feeling of all the major problems have been solved. And, and you know, the world is globalizing, the world is prospering, uh, there's one superpower and it's a benign superpower. On some of your topics in particular, um, you know, all of them, all of your books have a sort of sounding the alarm quality. And, and on none of the topics was I aware 20 years ago that the alarm was being sounded, even though the topic was in play. Um, so I'd just like to ask any of you to reflect on how the project of globalization is, is going, uh, about which there was so much um, optimism and perhaps hubris and, and uh, on your topic or in general, what do, what, what, what do we need to be thinking about? What should we be assigning new Columbia Global Reports books about? Well, that's a little different than where you started, but I just wanna comment on that, that sense. Um, and this isn't particularly global, but I, I, one of the things that really has changed uh, that's very relevant to my book are attitudes surrounding big tech. And, um, you know, it wasn't the early thousands, but I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of the antitrust movement, the anti-monopoly movement right now is driven by fear, in some cases, loathing of big tech and just a sense of, of a loss of, of power, of, of questions as to who really is in charge of the country, in charge of the economy. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that's, uh, you know, that, that was, there was a very different feeling even, even five years ago, forget about 20 years ago, even five, six, uh, seven years ago, uh, when I worked in the federal government, uh, you know, we, we thought of these companies as, as benign, beneficent, could do no wrong, um, almost like charities. Why would you want to break up the Red Cross? So I think that I just to, to, to take one thing that has certainly changed um, and has not gone away as an important uh, problem uh, is that- Margaret, um, to go from that to journalism in particular, I remember some of that feeling uh, in journalism about, you know, Google and Facebook were gonna be somehow great for journalism. Do you remember those days? I, I do, and, and in some ways, um, you know, the internet, I don't know about the social media platforms, but, but I guess I would include them to some extent the internet has been really good for journalism um, in terms of distribution, in terms of research, in terms of uh, being able to, you know, pull in all kinds of, of, of sources and audiences. It's been phenomenally good, but it has been harmful, at least on the local level, to the business of journalism and the revenue that supports journalists um, that is different um, at the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. Those places have found a way to pitch their product, if you want to call it that, to a, to a big and, yes, global audience. But local newspapers and local news organizations can't really do that. And so they, don't, they, are, they suffer from the lack of local uh, advertising and particularly print advertising. So it's, you know, and in terms of the timing, you're absolutely right that in somehow in 2002, 2003, it hadn't really hit home how brutal uh, this would be. And it was only it, with the, the recession that we really saw things fall off a cliff and they have not recovered. It's only gotten worse. Um, Jeff and Chris, sort of in my head at least, I'm ready to be corrected. The version of this was one: China's going to, you know, start behaving more like the U.S. in various ways. They've they've already gone capitalist. And it's inevitable that they'll go democratic also, and you know, to some extent, uh, the same vision for. Uh, 
Saudi Arabia and some of the rest of, of the region, that, that there would be an embrace of democracy and modernization and all that. So I'd like to hear each of you react to how, how that's working out. Um, yeah, I mean, Nick, I think in your question, um, you were gesturing to the end of history. And, you know, right, I, I, grew up, I grew up very much, you know, my entire life has been kind of in the post 9-11 world that end of history was never a paradigm that operated for me. But um, I think that we had this hangover, this total failure to understand the Islamic world that has led to some catastrophic foreign policy in this century. Um, and, you know, I think that part of my book was trying to desensationalize this really um, intense and scary sounding project that I wrote about because one of the biggest things that our foreign policy establishment still struggles with. And like Tim, I've definitely had people reach out to me to, you know, in DC to hear more about my research in the foreign policy world and the national security world. But um, the, the end of history is still completely has an ironclad grip and this refusal to understanding nuances in the Islamic world leads to a lot of our, our blunders. So I think there's a lot of room to change and especially to change the way we think about things like religion and democracy and secularism in places like Asia and Africa. Because um, some of these Cold War frameworks just have this like grip on the establishment that I think is pretty dangerous in the way we act abroad. So part of the reason I wrote my book was, you know, is, is one one way to chip away away at that, but it's going to be hard to shake. Jeff? So for me, one thing that, an event that really transformed my trajectory was in 1999, I went to Budapest to Central European University for a conference on the Tom in 1989. My role was to try to say, why didn't China get the memo that, you know, every democratization was the way to go? But I was the only China specialist there. And I listened to these very inspiring, some case former dissidents, um, talk about how there were rise of nationalism in the countries that were uh, that had freed themselves from Communist Party rule. And they were very worried about the possibility of shifts toward authoritarianism, even though at that point they were still being seen as success stories. There was already worry. And I think one of the things now um, that we've been learning lately in our country, as well as others, that things that we think we've moved beyond often are just dormant and come back. So I think one future Columbia Global Reports would be on Hungary, a uh, Central European University that had this inspiring conference uh, has been pushed out of the country. And now they're talking about having a Chinese university come in to provide the model of international uh, education there. So nope. you have these very strange, um, history does not move in one direction. Um, we have published a book about Hungary, but it was about dentists. And, um, but it was, it's a really good book by a wonderful journalist named Sasha Isenberg. And when we first started, I got a call from the then Dean of Columbia Med School, um, Lee Goldman. He said, come see me. I've got a bunch of ideas for you. And one of them was, he said, there's this thing called medical tourism that you need to write about. One of the many undercovered issues. And that's what that book is about. But that's another story. Um, we have to go. I want to say first, if history hasn't ended, that gives us a more urgent mission. So there's that. Um, and also, uh, you know, going back to what Margaret was saying, I hope you can tell from the foregoing that, um, you know, as wonderful as the internet is to put out information and receive it, to produce the work we do costs money. So that's the part that the existence of free communication on its own doesn't solve. Um, if you wanna stay involved with us, if you're not already, um, our website is globalreports, all one word, .edu. You can learn more about us and, and our books and various other activities like our podcast. Um, you can also subscribe and pay us a modest annual fee and we'll send you all of our books. Um, and if you wanna you know, get in touch with me personally, I'm at lemon, L-E-M-A-N-N, -E -N, at columbia.edu. Feel free to write me and I will answer. Um, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks, especially Lee and our four authors uh, for making time to do this. It, it means a lot. 
Um, and it's, um, it just, it, it, you know, like anybody who does anything every day, you're sort of dealing with whatever went wrong that day. And it's, it's nice for me and my colleagues to hear the aggregate of it all. So again, profound thanks to you for the work that you've all done to help get us to where we are and more to come. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.